King, page 217, talks about Boaz and uh, his experiences and a memory. A memory had been ghosting him for many years. I think that kind of means haunting him. Memory had been haunting him for many years. These days when we say we're ghosting somebody, we're, they're gone from us. But now we're just haunting him for many years. One that illustrated the terrifying cost of building a science of humankind. The terrifying cost of building a science of humankind. Or the dangers of treating people like they are under observation or in a laboratory. So the early anthropologists were admirably as we've talked about, admirably ahead of their times in terms of fighting against ideas of biological racism, fighting against ideas of ethnocentrism. But when they turned to their field of study, they really truly believed that they were that there was a whole laboratory of people out there, and that it was their responsibility to kind of harvest the information from this laboratory, to extract the information from this laboratory. And it led to, like I said, a lot of yuckiness. Um, this is on page 219. Ethnology could be a kind of blood sport, the domain of young, adventure-seeking researchers, almost entirely men, whose primary orientation was the acquisition of what they called data. So it's, again, and I... It, it, King also makes it clear that it's most almost always white men, young white men going out and getting data, getting stuff out, getting it back out from people and trying to publish it and get ahead of things. King calls this, and I believe it is entirely correct, a long continuum of exploitation ran from Kwakiutl villages and other anthropological field sites to Coney Island and beyond. The idea of putting people on display, going to see people, of exhibiting them, of paying money in order to see people's, people's weird skin and buttocks and hair and have them do things for you. So this is, uh, you know, this, this has been, as he puts it, a, a long tradition, and the, the tradition of anthropology was not as far removed from the from this those kinds of exhibitions that we would want it to be. Taylor, what happens to poor Kisuk? When everyone except young Minnick, that's his son, knew, however, was that the entire ceremony was a fake. There was no body left to bury. Isaac's remains had been dismembered by medical students at Bellevue. And one would want to believe that was for medical research, but actually it wasn't exactly for medical research. It was basically because they wanted to pry around and eventually put his skeleton on display as an Eskimo and study his brain and want a further study of Eskimo brains. And they, they didn't really get that much out of it. I mean, I know that medical research sometimes has to be done, right? And sometimes you need human subjects. And But this is, this is just, this wasn't really medical research. It, it was something else. Minnick goes in and tries to get his father's body back. <laughs> then the scandal erupts. But fortunately for Boaz, what happens to poor Minnick? <laughs> he dies too in the flu in the the last pandemic the flu of 2000 the great influenza epidemic of 1918 by the way charles king wrote this book before covid so he didn't he wasn't able to you know bring it back to us and tell us aha 100 years later or whatever 102 yeah so right so minnick then was a victim of the great influenza epidemic so the scandal dies down and then there's poor Ishi. Uh, you know, I meant to animate this, uh, this, this later. This was a book by the anthropologist Oren Starn, who was kind of retracing in a personal way what happened to Ishi. 
Juliana, what happens to Ishii? What's he dragged into? <laughs> Yeah, this was, he comes in to the anthropology department and and one of the anthropologists, Alfred Krober, says, aha, it's, you know, the last, the last of this, in this indigenous group, the last wild indigenous group. And as King says, that really wasn't true. They'd been, I mean, they'd been driven from their lands, massacred. There was a lot of them around, actually, but they were basically living as as vagrants. But wait, Julian, what would they do with this guy? What would they make him do? Put him in photo shoots. Ah, photo shoots and made him pose with various things to the point where this one person... I killed him by letting Sapir ride him too hard, recalled another California anthropologist, Thomas Waterman, who considered Ishii his best friend. Sapir, we'll talk about in a second, but Sapir was that famous linguist, uh, and he was the one that did these photo shoots. I mean, it's hard to say that you wouldn't want... It may have been an exaggeration that I killed him by letting Sapir ride him too hard, but you know, it wasn't probably wasn't the nicest thing to do. Let's see. Ah, oh, yeah, page 222. By the time Mead, that's Margaret Mead, joined the museum as a junior curator, she walked to work every day past an entire graveyard of human remains. Drawers and vitrines held the bones of real people who had ended up as museum artifacts only because their families and neighbors hadn't been powerful enough to stop it. King says that this is thankfully mostly done now and we've learned, but you know, to be Terribly honest about this, I mostly done. There's actually still right today, there's still uh there's some controversy about some remains uh from contemporary uh groups that are being kept and moved around and used for teaching for who knows what reason. And so these are these are not <laughs> these are not completely over. At least people are are talking about them in, in different ways today, but it's not completely over. So, like I said, this chapter should let you, you know, a little bit of stuff that's uh, the kind of backstory of stuff that we don't want to, but really do need to think about uh, in anthropology. We also learn here about the Omaha. Omaha. Brady, tell us about the Omaha. What happened to them? Yeah, they got pushed around. How do you know the Omaha? When I say Omaha, what's the first thing we think of? <laughs> right. <laughs> there we go. In some city in Nebraska. At least uh, that's what I think. I mean, it's, it's kind of amazing how the people, the, the people that these are from these groups come to represent these places. Later on in the chapter, they talk about the Coeur d'Alene people and the linguistic research. And then I remembered that I grew up not too far away from Coeur d'Alene and never thought about it. You know, I never thought about, oh, wait, there were maybe people. Now the Omaha get super studied and because they were, they had been basically relocated onto this reservation, but they were kind of a jumping off point for uh, 
people to go in and talk about uh, indigenous Native American traditions. And the Omaha became very famous. There was a book published called by the by called Omaha Sociology. Uh, Omaha kinship was, you know, the idea, we talked about these different forms of kinship and they had a very complex notion of kinship. And so everybody would learn about the Omaha and they'd learn about them as if they were the Omaha. A group sharing many identity markers was referred to as homogeneous. This is way from the beginning of Gonzalez, uh, the textbook, we talked about homogeneous societies. But the problem is, as we've talked about a little bit, when you go and talk to the Omaha about their kinship system or about their dances or about their ceremonies or about what an object means, what tends to happen when you go talk to the Omaha? You're talking about, hey, what do you do at this party or this kinship ceremony or those kinds of things. What do you get? Yeah. Well, you get some of that. Of course, people are going to tell you, you know, this is our tradition. This is what we've always done. And then you go to somebody else, and what do they have to say? Yeah. Something different. There's this amazing passage in here. It's actually kind of do I want to say hilarious? <laughs> I don't want to say hilarious because you're not laughing. But it's about this person wrote a book and he basically documented all these times when various people in society he'd document the thing or the dance or the kinship system. And then he'd have to say, but so and so says that's bullshit. <laughs> so in this case, it's often two crows, but two crows denies. He's like, no, we didn't do it that way. That, totally wrong. Totally. We don't have, no, that kinship, no, that doesn't work that way. And so it raises a huge issues about this idea of, of people living in a homogeneous society, which is to say, how do you draw the boundaries around that society? How many people do you need to talk to before you decide, aha, I've got it. All these people agree on this thing. They're all sharing these identity markers. And that is why I tried to tell you back in the day when we talked about homogeneous and heterogeneous that all societies are going to vary. They're all heterogeneous. And it's actually difficult to figure out how are you going to measure this homogeneity? What percentage of people do you need? How many dissenters do you need? Are you going to talk to the people who left town, who left that society? Do they belong anymore? Are you going to, where do you draw the line? Are you only talking about the society that came before? So it brings up some huge issues about the, the validity of the research and the validity of this so-called data that people were, were gathering. And, uh, you know, you're always going to have people who say something different, who, who say and believe something different. And as he points out, it's one thing when somebody says one plus one equals three, you say, no, it's not true. Mathematically speaking, it's true. But when somebody talks about their own society, you kind of have to listen to them because that's an opinion that matters as well. It's a cultural or social thing. And going back to Sapir, we talked about Sapir a bit back in the day. We've talked about him in terms of his brilliant linguistic analysis and ideas about language, but he also wrote an article or, or words on what he called culture genuine and spurious. And so he believed that there were certain cultures that were kind of more homogeneous and put together and, and, and clear. He, did, he was not talking about, again, he was, he was in some ways thinking that our own society, our own society was more on the side of the spurious, that we were kind of all jumbled up. So he wasn't trying to make a make a, a generalization about the modern and the primitive, but he did have this idea of wholeness or coherence, or at least he was thinking about that. And it was something that for many people who were studying groups like the Omaha, like it says, Margaret Mead tried to go to the Omaha, and she said, a thing like this isn't a culture, hardly even the remains of one. 
So in her point of from her point of view, this was th these were people who had been jumbled together. They weren't even a culture anymore. They weren't uh, they weren't even uh, having to be around. But we see here that uh, that Sapir in this section starts to be a little more reflective. He starts to think a little bit more about what's going on and about two crows and a little bit about you know well. The fact that people are saying different things. Pluto, what is what does Sapir come to the conclusion of? Or how does he how does he start to believe here? Yeah, Sapir, who oh, he looks like one of those people who would be. Look at him; he looks like one of those people who would be kind of on the side of people as mere data generators. But he said it was supremely important to think of people as people first, not as mere data generators. A lesson he might have given to an earlier version of himself in his work with Ishi. That is, hey. Don't just set people up for a photo shoot and ride them so hard that they die. That's not good, right? So he does later in his life come to this conclusion that people aren't supposed to be just data generators. What else, Francis? What else does he think there? Yeah, so Sapir, King says he comes clean. Sapir, uh, cultures didn't live out there floating above the heads of their practitioners. So it's not that there's, there's no culture outside of the people that are actually doing it. You should therefore give up the idea of ever arriving at a once and for all definition of what this or that society is really like. What you should do instead is to come clean, to admit that the closest you as a stranger can ever come to an account of social reality is to report on what an expert, someone who lives in that reality, happens to think it is. And so again, perhaps later in his life, Sapir is, uh, and he's, Seems to be getting nicer a little bit too. Going back with Boaz when Boaz's wife dies and taking a train ride with him. But he seems to be trying to understand how to put people first before this idea of data collection. Of course, in some ways, the solution, the solution to anthropology's problems was staring them right in the face with. Hurston's work and Deloria's work, and we talked about in the last class, class Dor Zora Neale Hurston as an anthropologist, that although Boaz was making her cry because she wasn't doing the, the straight forward ethnography that he was wanting her to write, she'd done more field work than he had done and than me had done. And she was writing about real people in real time instead of casting them in what we call the ethnographic present as if they're timeless. And she was defending their basic humanity. And so I think that if we read Deloria's work and again, Hurston, we see that some of these people who never were able to get anthropology degrees and may not have been able in various ways to be part of the graduate program, understood that you needed people before data. It's not that you don't want data, of course you want data, but people first, people before data. And both of them had long-term fieldwork experience. That you had to, it wasn't just enough to go in and go for a few months and then come out with a bunch of kinship charts and call it a day. And I'm not saying you can't gain something from a short stay if you, if you can do it, any field work is better than no field work at all, but just be upfront, come clean about how much field work you've done and what you who you've been able to talk to. Both Deloria and Hurston were not necessarily studying themselves in the sense that they weren't completely members of the societies that they were talking about, but they certainly had a sense of 
talking to people and taking indigenous people or natives seriously, not just as people who would who were there to comment and give you stories, but who might have something to say about life and about uh, about the theories that you were organized. And of course, Delory and Hurston were in kind of in these worlds. Uh, Hurston is an African American, and Deloria as an in indigenous or a Native American. Um, they were part of that world too. And so we've talked about that, that both of them were writing and studying real people in particular times and places and not sacrificing them to become the this, the people who do this kinship system or the people who always do this dance or this ritual or or uh, do uh, cross cousin marriage. Real people who do real things. So, uh, and in both cases, they wanted to work with the people who were right there in front of them. And not just to see these people as kind of a degraded version of something they might have been a hundred years ago, or in Zora Neale Hurston's case, that African -Amer Americans were a degraded version of something that came from Africa, but as people who were actively creating and navigating their own culture in the present, not just a sal salvaging, salvaging the, the old ways before they disappeared. Actually, Felicia, you had a great quote about this. I mean, the way that Deloria looked at language. Said that these speeches were coming from people who and and culture. Speech was constantly changing. The trick was be to begin to hear it all, to regard the living languages that still dotted the plains, not as a dreadful remnant, but as a thing existing in the real, quickened now. To write properly about Indians, you had to stop using the past tense. Actually, I'm also reminded here, I forgot to mention that uh, she was from in and around Standing Rock, which came into national prominence again in the last, uh, I think in the, around 2015, with the uh, Dakota Access Pipeline and the protests at Standing Rock. That's where it was. Mobile, yeah. So, I mean, yeah. Uh, and that was where, uh, that's one of the places, that's where Deloria was from, actually. Uh, so again, and, and I guess that, that, that's part of the present as well. You have to stop using the past tense. So the, the solution, as a, I put it, to the worries, to the problems of anthropology and the data gathering and the exploitation was, was right there in front of them in some Ting portrays this as uh, at the end of the chapter that like he did with Hurston, he said that in some ways, uh, yeah, this is uh, Zora Neale Hurston on the, your left and uh, Elacora Deloria on the right. There are Wikipedia pictures. Um, and as he did with uh, Zora Neale Hurston, he says that both of them were in some ways embodying the spirit of Boaz, the spirit of what Boaz was trying to do, demonstrating that, that how to verify Boaz's foundational theory, that the people whose remains had been put on display, whose cultures were made over as pop primitivism, were fully human after all. And I think King is correct that they do embody the spirit but what then became entrenched as sort of academic anthropology went way different than what happened to Hurston and Deloria. Both of them, we'll find out later, basically uh, passed away penniless, unknown. Um, the, the project that they were working on um, has only later been something that, uh, that anthropology has, has found of value. At the time, yeah, I mean, people valued it, but not, it wasn't, it wasn't the mainstream. It didn't become uh, part of it. 
and <laughs> one of the reasons we probably know that it it didn't become the mainstream. So we talked about Vine Deloria Jr.'s work back in uh, I think it was the first or first first chapter of um, of Gonzalez and talking about some of these issues and. Vine Deloria Jr. is actually uh, Delor. I'm say Ella Cora Deloria would be his aunt. So he, he, he was her nephew, and he wrote a very famous passage, a very famous chapter in this book, uh, which says that you know Indians have been cursed above all other people in history. Indians have anthropologists. And so obviously it didn't, he didn't think it must have worked out if his own aunt who basically qualified and did a lot of anthropological work. And he's like, no, that is, that is not going to work for us. If we want to actually change the condition of Native Americans, we are going to have to, uh, we're going to have to change that being studied to study with or study.